I hereby call to order this committee the whole meeting. It's Monday, April 19th, 2021, and the time is 8 18. Will the clerk please call the roll? Here. 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 Great. Thank you. I seek a motion to approve the March 15, 2021 Committee to Whole and Executive Session Minutes. I move to approve the District 39 Board of Education Committee of the Whole meeting that was held on Monday, March 15, 2021 minutes. May I have a second? Second. Motion having been made and seconded. Board members, are there any comments, errors, or omissions to the minutes? Okay. Seeing none, will the... Uh, do we need to do a roll call? Uh, we just no. vote. Everyone All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Let's begin with Facility Development Committee. I turn the meeting over to FTC Chair Ellen Sternweiler. Um, can you hold on, Ellen, for one second? I can't yeah. hear her. Can you? Can you guys hear? You're not going to hear through this system? Okay, sorry. Oh, speak up. Oh, just speak up. We're doing it for the benefit, not just of at the table, but for that device right there. The okay, clearly I <laughs> register. Speak Thank up. you. <laughs> Hello. I'll speak up and speak Jack. Thank you, Ellen. You're welcome. President of Faith. <laughs> We have a summer construction update. Mackenzie, Ramona, and WJ Jess uh, on um, those three schools. Sorry, <laughs> um, uh, Joe Papa Nicholas will update the board on how the Ramona and Mackenzie projects have been going so far. Um, Corey will update the board on some work um, on some work projects completed at WJ Jess over spring break in preparation for the large summer project and um, some additional asbestos work at McKenzie has been identified and details of that work will be shared with the board. So I think I will turn this over to Joe. Sure, good morning, everyone. Hi, Joe. Good morning, Joe. So we've been, uh, we've been at it about three weeks. I'll start with McKenzie. Uh, our first big, uh, our fi first big goal uh, was to relocate some existing utilities um, it was it was a mix of site demolition and this relocation of these utilities, all in an effort to start foundation work. So um, it went it went extremely smooth. It was a tremendous amount of work um, that had been completed that first week, um, which all led to um, foundation excavation and then ultimately placing the foundation. So as we sit right now at McKenzie, the foundation has been um, completed. Uh, we're in the process of actually backfilling. Um, right now, um, which will then move into uh, underground work um, this week, and then ultimately our concrete slab uh, for the for the addition will be placed by the end of this week. Um, every, everything's weather permitting. Um, knock on wood. Uh, so far, we haven't lost a day due to the weather since we started. Um, so we'll, we'll take it. Um, just looking out ahead of McKenzie. Um, we have steel uh, arriving next month, um, probably the middle of next month. So that's sort of our goal. Um, once this concrete slab gets placed, uh, hopefully the end of this week, the mason will start running up his, uh, his block walls in preparation of that steel next week. Um, over at Ramona, um, a lot of the same types of scopes. Um, we did not have any major uh, utility relocates that first week. Um, so we've been focusing on, on both additions um, at Ramona. Again, site demolition took place, foundations are in. Um, we actually did get the slab on grade place last Friday at Ramona. So we've had the weekend for it to cure. Um, it'll cure today. Um, the Mason will start running up his, his block work um, this week at Ramona. On the north side, um, the north side addition, uh, foundations are also complete. We're gonna start backfilling um, we have a little bit of underground up there as well, um, and we'll look to place that concrete slab on grade by the end of the week. So in essence, uh, next week, it'll be masonry work at both sites uh, in preparation of steel delivery next month. And this all leads to hopefully having an enclosed addition um, come June, 
and we're left with essentially uh, an interior build out for the summer to go along with the, the summer critical renovation work. So that, that's kind of high level where we're at. Everything's on schedule. Again, we haven't missed a day since we started three weeks ago at both sites. Um, from an unforeseen standpoint, um, very minimal, um, which is great. So we did anticipate some poor soil at both sites. Um, so we made provisions within the bid to accommodate that to avoid um, any post bid uh, impacts that would uh, bite into the contingency. So, so all has been, uh, all is going extremely well. Does anybody have any questions um, for me at either site? Joe, did you run into that soil issue at both sites? Mm -hmm. We did. And we also ran into the original roadway uh, behind McKenzie that used to travel right by the main, the main building uh, coming from the alleyway. So as we were excavating the entire paved roadway, the pavers, the curbs, and the stumps from the parkway trees were 100% intact. So that was kind of interesting. So at some point in time, somebody made the decision, let's just uh, throw a bunch of bad soil over the existing road and just leave the road, cut the trees down, leave the stumps, and that was that. Forty years ago, I would think at least. <laughs> well, that was interesting. <laughs> well, thank you, Joe, for the update. Any mm -hmm. questions? Thanks, Joe. And then, as far as the junior high um, contractors are verifying as much as they can in the field, um, just in preparation of uh, of our June start. At the junior high, it worked out well with um, at least initiating the equipment orders for the junior high with the unit vents and the chiller. So, so that worked out really well, and um, we don't have any concerns with uh, with lead time. All right. Um, any questions on all, any of that? Corey. I don't have anything to add okay. as it relates to those two things, but I'll jump to the next part if, if uh, Joe is Joe is finished. Thanks. Yep, you're welcome. All right, so I just wanted to briefly share about some of the asbestos work that's been occurring at both buildings. I just want to I'll share my screen so people can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so first we'll just take a look at um, the junior high. So uh, thankfully we have a very proactive um, construction team and as, there, as we got close to opening the bids, there was some realization that with the design plans, there, may, may, there was likely to be some asbestos abatement that needed to be done. And as it relates to a project like this, one of the kind of things that drives how much needs to be done is what does the contractor that's going to be working in the ceilings feel needs to be done. So once we, we had opened up those bids in March, our um, asbestos abatement team met with the contractor. They walked through the, all the rooms that they were going to be in. And if we look on the right side of this floor plan, um, there's a blue hallway I'm kind of hovering around, has the rooms 127 through 133, that is where um, from, from a work standpoint they were able to seal off that whole hallway and for, from our perspective because the construction window over the summer is tight for that project, they were able to do that over spring break when no one was in the, when uh, you know, no students and staff were, were in the building. So they were able to successfully get that completed um, which will allow the project during the summer to move a lot quicker and smoother. Then over at McKenzie, um, if you look on the right-hand side, there's a, near the letters N and M, there's an office suite of 105, which is going to be reconfigured. That whole area um, needs asbestos abatement. We knew about that. That'll happen after the school year is over. Um, but the new part 
at least that recently came to it to our attention as we renovate classroom one hundred and expand the cafeteria there's probably a pretty good chance some of the stuff that's attached to the walls there may be some asbestos work that go behind it and then one of the other smaller things that you know we do each summer whether it's replace tile or flooring or paint you know things that we do in small amounts at a lot of different buildings in a typical summer one of the things that's unique about McKenzie is as you look at the left hand side of this this map the entire second floor has asbestos everywhere so the current construction the current layout of that second floor is there's tile carpet on top of the tile and as I talked with Dana about you know their buildings request to start moving towards replacing that the carpet that's on top of the tile goes back to 97 and 98 so so we brought out our asbestos team and started developing a plan so we will this is something that just from like a safety standpoint of being able to seal off you know smaller areas make it manageable for that team and then have our people you know move everything around and still be able to get all their work done this will probably take over multiple summers but that is something that we will start on the south end of the building the very bottom where that green hallway is tackle the hallway and the couple of the classrooms so I just wanted to make the board aware jump in in terms of asbestos it is contained under the tile under the carpet in the flooring area not located in other areas if anything in most of our spaces if there was just anywhere else it would probably be something behind like a wall if they were to do that but in our particular case you know one of the reasons that we would go ahead and do this is that if they were to pull up the carpet the chances that they rip up the tile when they is significantly high and then once it's exposed you really need to you know have that a be a controlled environment so that's why we're proactively having the abatement team go ahead and tackle that and just to be clear for everyone the worry about asbestos isn't when it's contained and untouched it's when you want to uncover it or move it or do anything disrupt it that's when the abatement process needs to start so there are no worries with it right now but if we do want to replace the flooring that would then require abating the asbestos abatement what are we looking at replacing it with as we replace it are we looking at replacing tile and carpet or carpet so the request from the school if you walk through the first floor of McKenzie the hallway is VCT composite tile the request is now so the right now the entire second floor is carpet the hallways would be tile anywhere around like a drinking fountain there would be like slip resistant tile and then the classrooms would be carpet squares and then they usually if a classroom has a sink or you know bathroom in it then there would be tile there the VCT is well there and one of the reasons that we have would like to do the carpet tiles or carpet squares is that going forward if a particular spot in the room either gets damaged or you need to replace it you just you can just rip up a couple of squares replace it versus if you had it you know rooms being carpeted with one big roll some of the things I've seen in my career you get a bubble people cut the bubble then they tape it down you know there's no easy way if you're not doing carpet squares in the classroom to easily fix that so I don't know if this is a question for um Colby or for Sandoz but um because I think that's who goes through the materials um we so for that we work with like for the like for the some of the smaller projects that's handled by our um director of operations and maintenance and then with directly with the contractor and we are we replacing with um environmentally um safe it's like environmentally conscious materials so carpet that is carpet or tile is either recycled or green carpet or I don't have the specific answer on look into that I can ask them what they you know the if we're going to do this over a long period of time it would be nice 
to be to go green with this and help you with no with carpets that don't emit any kind of toxins. I mean, if we're going to replace um, asbestos with something else, we should replace it. In my opinion, we should be looking at replacing it with you know non-toxic materials and also hopefully something that's recycled and you know healthy for the environment in general. Um, if we can't, yes. if it's you know to strive to be a greener school, just you know school district. So. Okay. Um, any other questions from anybody else or thoughts on this? I, I agree with your point. I think it's a good point. Okay. Um, and actually, yeah, that's it for facilities. So um, back to President Fabe. Awesome. <laughs> Next, we have School Finance Committee. Oh wait, Nicole, should we just say goodbye to everybody? Yeah. Oh yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a great week. Bye yep. Have a great week. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Um, great. So now we're turning it over to the School Finance Committee. I turn the meeting over to SFC Chair, Mr. Cesaretti. Thank you, President Faves. Um, I, I think Corey is going to talk about um, federal funds. Sure. So what we just wanted to update the board about is there was a, in March there was another round uh, of federal money um, geared at helping, among many things, uh, school districts. So each one has their own acronym uh, in the school realm. They call it SR1, SR2, SR3, just to keep it simple. Um, when you read stuff in the paper, you'll probably see a different acronym. The first one that goes back to last March, um, we have spent, that was about 80000 We had to share a little bit of that with um, the, some of the private schools in our community, that money has been spent. Then ESSER II, which was passed over the uh, around the winter break time, um, in the application module that we would apply to ISBE with, the amount is 314,000 for for District 39. Um, since that shows up in the application module, that's a pretty so that should be a solid amount. Um, when I read through the spending requirements, uh, it looks like we have until September of 23 to spend that money, and it is really, really flexible on what what we would get reimbursed for. Um, so it's, which is a good thing for school districts because not everybody may have the same need. Um, so as an administrative team, we're working working through those details. And then the biggest one, and the reason we wanted to bring it up today, ESSER 3, our allocation preliminarily from ISB is 705,000. Uh, that's based upon about five, about a five billion dollar allocation to Illinois for for schools. Um, w embedded within that 705,000, there is a requirement that at least 20% of the money goes towards learning loss. So for us, that's 140-ish, 140,000. And then there hasn't been much, since this is so new, there hasn't been much other guidance. The actual module that we would log in and see all the requirements, um, ISB has told us that won't go live until July 1st. So there's still a lot of details, but that one, that particular grant has an end date of September of 2024. So it's not as if you got it, you got to use it in one year. It does give districts, um, you know, 700,000 is certainly a lot of money. Other districts are getting several millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. So, um, you know, for districts to use it wisely, it, it, they're giving us a lot of time to plan and be thoughtful about that. Um, so we'll have more details as we get more information over the next several months. But we do plan to uh, try and connect that 705,000 to our strategic planning process since we're, we're getting, getting going with that this week. Um, make sure that all that's aligned. Does anyone have any 
questions about any of those? Um, just for background, the, um, the formula, as much as it can be understood, and I understand there's lots of, lots of gray areas in there, is based on the number of kids identified. I mean, what's, what's the base? That's the allocation method. Yeah. In each of the ones that I've seen, the primary, the, the allocation method has been low income. So what the, the big spreadsheet that I saw for when the ISB released the ESSER 3 was there was a column that said what percentage of the low income kids in the entire state does D39 have? And then you get that times, you know, 5 billion or whatever. So that's how they, so districts that have, you know, well north of 50%, they're the ones that are going to get ten, probably tens of millions of dollars. Um, so that is, the, that is the primary driving factor. Yeah, we, we run just under 2% in that category, yeah. is that about right? It's a little higher than that, but yeah, it's, okay. it's pretty low in, yeah. our, in our community. So just the, like I said, some school, we multiply that number by 50. To make sure I understand. So we're still trying to figure out what the restrictions are for the for the latest round. For the bigger number. Yeah, they're. Okay. I mean, they got, they're. Other, you know, really the the only thing I could really definitively offer that I've seen in a lot of places is the 20% towards learning loss. Yeah. I suspect that the remaining 80% will be really flexible, similar to the other stuff. Yeah. You know, as you can imagine, I would think that. You know. Other like more hot districts with a lot of low income may have some facility needs or equipment needs or just different things that we've already tackled as a district. So I, I expect massive amounts of flexibility within that grant. John, what we're being told is that the application will be open sometime this summer. So it's not until the application comes out that we really have a good understanding of what those limitations will be. That 20% is the one element that most superintendents at least have heard a lot about, that you have to spend at least 20% on learning loss, recovery, and social emotional support. So, okay. yeah. But we are really excited that uh, we might be able to tie this directly to the strategic plan and some of the goals that are identified there. And the opportunity to use it over three years really gives us some sustainability of impact there, um, although our dollars, to Frank's point, are certainly not nearly uh, what some districts will see, um, valuable dollars nonetheless that we can really target and earmark for those improvement efforts. Well, and, and you, I would say I, I share your excitement, actually. I'm really excited, not because of the 700000 that's always nice to get, but um, really because I think we probably identify areas where we are um, where we need, where we can do the most to improve what we're doing in the schools, right? So the pandemic kind of helps expose some areas where, hey, you know, maybe we can do better here. Maybe these are the shaky areas that we can. So I, it's a it's a really nice forcing function to have to go through and say, okay, let's think about where we had learning loss because those are probably areas where we had good investments to make already. So I, I think it's really exciting, and I agree with tying into the strategic process. That's perfect. Frank, did you want to add something? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Uh, no, it, it it was related to cash flow. I mean, for, for our district, this money is relatively in the noise, so I was going to ask about, you know, do we have to, can't we spend it all in one year? Do we have to spread it out? But from a cash flow standpoint, it doesn't really matter. So we, we don't have to spend any time on that. And one of the challenges always with dollars like these is that um, once you spend them, you, you need to plan that they won't be there indefinitely. Yeah. So um, it is good practice to plan for a sustained expenditure there so that you can see the impact of those dollars being spent rather than one quick shot in the arm that you didn't foresee in the long term. So um, we, we really do hope to be able to identify some of those three-year uh, plans for the Thank you, Karen. Back to you, President Thames. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to strategy items. Um, the strategy, uh, I turn the meeting over to strategy chair, Mark Dean. Thank you very much. And we have two items today. One is our strategy update. That we were just talking about our strategy plan. 
and then we'll have a metrics update. And I think for the strategy update, we're going to Katie Lee. Yeah. We just wanted to um, update the board on the progress we've made so far in the strategic plan, uh, planning process. And so um, the initial meetings um, were with the core team, which is the district administrators, and um, it was with our consultant. And so those two readiness meetings have been completed, which told us the direction that we need to go as far as preparation on the back end. One of which is the stakeholder awareness communication. So we have utilized our email system, obviously within our families and parents within District 39, our um, principals for our staff, as well as um, can use weekly communications to staff and family as well. Uh, for the community at large, um, tapped into some of the emails and um, contacts that the CRC was able to compile for us as well as the village was able to provide all of the businesses that are um, in our area um, their email addresses. So we communicated out in multiple ways. There are two community newsletters. Uh, we'll met, uh, there's a Wilmette newsletter and a Glenview focused one because we do have families in Glenview. And so we have been posting on there as well an awareness and also the survey went out in the, um, in that piece, or through those communications. One other thing that we did was create a uh, landing page, which after I go through this list, I'd like to show you um, on the screen. Um, the, that is where all of the information will be stored. Um, and so many people can, anyone who wants to, can access that page and find the information that we are, as a team, going to be going through, as well as some background information about the process. So I will share that with you. So all the meeting dates and times are established. Um, tomorrow is our kickoff with our orientation meeting. And so um, that has been communicated out to all of the uh, members of the full team. We have approximately 47. And I believe that Lisa and Amy have received um, my email about that. Um, and then the other pieces is for future meetings. But we are working on this on the back end um, here. So one is a perception survey, which goes to all stakeholders, so community at large, identifying as businesses or families with no children in the district. Um, we have communities within that parents, families, um, teachers, administrators, uh, staff, all staff of District 39, and then of course our students. Uh, we are, we've elected to survey fourth through eighth grade um, for that population. Um, so, and it's, and it's actually um, a lot of data coming in, so people are responding. Uh, as of this morning, we have about 287 from staff, uh, 564 from parents and families, 1,303 from students, um, 4 through 8. I think it's primarily actually our 5-8 campus that have done that. So we're making sure that our elementary will also do it, and they have time because it's not due until the 23rd or 21st. And then the community, we have 40. So we're trying really hard, but the community at large is a little bit more of a challenge to try to reach. But we do have businesses and also homeowners um, that do not have children out of the 40 that's uh, represented. Uh, and that's, that's really all. So let me take a moment here. And on the homepage of Wilmette well, District 39, uh, you will notice here at the very top in the recent news, and it'll stay there, it'll be pinned to the top. Um, that is where um, anyone who is interested could access the web page with all of the materials. And then when you click on this link, which I'm just going to go to the tab, this is where the landing page um, lives, and this is the information that is provided. So the process in general, our current strategic plan, the schedule of meetings, as well as all of our team members. And then if you scroll down, after every meeting, all reference documents, all materials, all resources, everything we use as a team will be posted there. So anyone can go and follow along um, if they wish. And that's all. I can answer questions if you have, do you have any. Questions from board members? Um, for the community at large, um, I don't know if I missed it or um, if it's um, just background, but since I don't have a, a child in the school district, I don't I don't remember receiving anything 
um, related to this? So how was the community at large being contacted? Um, Frank, that's actually, that was, that's one of the challenges that we have is um, outside, because uh, we have access to emails um, for the communities within. And so for the community at large, we chose two very public newsletters, and I guess if you um, receive them or pay attention to all of it, you might have seen it, but it easily could be missed as well, I suppose. Uh, but there's a Will Met uh, newsletter and a Glenview newsletter. That's not from us, it's from the community. So I'm happy to, and I'm, I apologize, but I'm happy to forward that on since obviously we know who you are, but I think that's another thing we need to do is tap into, um, you know, how we can get it out to everyone. Uh, the businesses was a little bit easier for us just because the village has a list of every business, and so we were able to push it out that way. So I apologize for that, but we're going to, we'll continue to improve on that part. I don't know if you received the newsletters. Like yeah, so the 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 yeah, I, I, I get that, but you know, it's it's a fairly long newsletter. I, I skimmed through it. It's not highlighted yeah. super. And and frankly, even though this is something that I deal with, I didn't find it. So mm -hmm. it's you know, it's always hard to get a hold of that group of people. Right. But and the 40 responses is an indicator that we haven't found that group of people yet. Um, but it does represent 70% of the taxpayers, so mm -hmm. um, we need to to keep working on that. Mm -hmm. As a as a side note to that or a personal note to that, I need to get what parents in the community is getting as a board member to be aware of what's going on. I mean, a lot of maybe all the other board members have kids, um, so they do see that. Um, so I would really like to be added to that list so that I can see what parents are getting, um, especially if it is highlighted differently or focused differently. You know, I don't have access to that, and um, so I'd really appreciate being added to that mailing list. I think those went out to each school community directly. That the principal newsletter is the way um, those go out every Friday. Um, We'll have to think about if it makes sense to send you every school newsletter each Friday. Um, what we were finding is, the feedback we were getting is sending a district update and a school update and a couple of other kind of miscellaneous updates to families each week uh, was filling families' inbox so much that they were disregarding yeah. all of it. So we've streamlined everything with the feedback from um, a number of different parent groups to put everything, even even my updates, the district updates, go into the, that that. Um, weekly newsletter from our principals. And so, but you are right that that then leaves um, some people not receiving some of that information. So, so let's let's talk more about that. Yeah, let's you know, pick a school. But, um, yeah. Other thoughts on this? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I had a thought about, um, you know, parents, you know, kind of like Frank who had kids in the district, do, do we have those lists? Do we keep, that, I would think that'd be a fairly long mm -hmm. list. We have historical, yeah. we have emails from past students. We would have to go back and pull them from the database, but they are available. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's a great suggestion. Might we can certainly up. push out a communication to those addresses. Mm -hmm. Ellen? Um, I'm wondering if <clears throat> it's just reaching out to some of our partnering organizations, such mm -hmm. as we, we know that, for instance, our students move on to Nutrier. Mm -hmm. If Nutria would be willing to put a blurb out to um, parents um, and to say, you know, to all parents who had kids in District 39, you know, who still live there, you know, th that kind of thing. Um, this is what's going on. You know, pay attention. Um, we want your feedback. That's that's a huge group. Mm -hmm. Like Frank, it would have caught Frank. The other uh, organization I was thinking of is the library. Um, if the library would be willing to put something in their newsletter because there are a lot of um, people that, you know, might have grandchildren in the district that get that regularly read the newsletter from the library, um, possibly even the League of Women Voters or um, the police department even. You know, they put out a they put out a news a little news thing every week just to kind of tell you what's going on in the district. Um, so just things like that where we can just, 
you know, reach out to our partners and just say, can, would you be willing to do this? It's a big, it's an important thing. It's a, it's a kind of, it's our strategic plan. It, it, it affects our community culture. And um, so I think they would probably be willing to do that. You said I thought I saw your hand up. Did you have yeah, something Yeah, I, I, I do think, um, right, we put it in the village emails, we put it in the park district emails, like at, at one point there's a standard of reasonableness, yeah. right? It, it, it's up to people to read these newsletters and decide if they want to engage. And so from my perspective, you know, we do another pass at all our partner newsletters and, and we can feel like we've done a good faith effort. Yeah. You can lead a horse to water, but the truth is if you don't have kids in D39, the likelihood of you wanting to spend another hour on Zoom to participate in our strategic planning is, is probably small. So I just want to make sure we prioritize. I was just going to say in terms of our board representation, Lisa and I are participating, but I would encourage any other board members who are not on the team to read those resources that Katie just pointed out and to share with us your thoughts about the data that gets posted and the articles or anything so that we can bring your interests, ideas, thoughts to the meetings and also to, you know, it's on us to share with you what's happening so that it's real representation of our board as a whole. And that was one other question I had actually. Thank you, Amy. I, I was going to actually ask, if, does the, um, have, you, have you involved former board members? I think that that was one of the groups that the CRC identified as, um, as someone to reach out to. I don't think we have a, a former board member on our core team at this point, but reaching out to them to ask them to respond to the survey would be great. Mm -hmm. You might have a future former board member of volunteering over there as far as I can um, and I and we uh, I can't remember. Did we we've done something with preschools in the area? That's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because that that seems like the group. To to Lisa's point, like those are the people who are going to be most interested in what's going on in the schools five years from now. We were part of the recruitment group, and so we do have a volunteer from that group sitting, having a seat on our team, as well as communication about surveys and everything that are sent directly to them. So you identified a challenge you have with the community outreach. We've, the board has given you some brainstorming thinking on that. Is there any other support that we can give you or is there anything else that you need from us as you think about the strategic planning going forward? No, I think um, these suggestions are great and I will definitely follow through on them. Uh, if you can just continue to spread the word as you do, as you know in your neighborhoods of uh, different families and communities at large or even within if they haven't engaged in any of the surveys because there's going to be multiple opportunities and so these are the groups that we'll be consistently reaching out to uh, throughout the process. So if you just continue to do what you're doing, it's, that's helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is a, a super important project obviously for the district and for the school board. So uh, I think we need to think about how to make this a interactive process for the school board. Um, this is, uh, this isn't, a, you know, we have two representatives, they know our minds and they represent us and then in June we find out what comes out. Obviously it has to have a, a cycle of feedback and input and discussion from the board, direction, the ideas of what the board's interested in. Um, balance with obviously all the other stakeholders. Um, so I think we need to think about how we want the board to have an interactive process here to update inputs to the board representatives, board representatives updating us um, as we understand in the first couple of meetings what some of the rest of these meetings are going to look like. I think that's an important item that the board needs to consider. Um, as a model, I think I'm thinking more along the lines of how we do contract negotiations. That we have two representatives, but we have the board, you know, with guidance and being, you know, here's things that we think you should represent us on, and then the 
representatives come back and say, here's what's happening that may change those things. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking more of that type of interaction than, a, you know, we have two representatives as good as they are, you know, and then come back in June because in the long run, it's a contract between the school board and the superintendent. Um, and I think there's a requirement that we vote on it. So mm -hmm. the school, the, the, um, we need to be interactive in those steps so it doesn't end up being, you know, a surprise or, mm -hmm. or you know, different direction than the, the board feels comfortable with when we have a vote. We really don't want to end up, you know, having a four to three or, or even a negative vote um, on something that's important. So a couple of thoughts there, Brent. Um, so first of all, the process was selected by the board, and the process is driven really by the process of CEC, um, the Consortium for Education Change, and that really is a stakeholder-driven process. And so um, throughout the process, the board will get updates and have the opportunity to provide feedback um, it sounds like what you're, you're looking for is a little more involvement, even so. And so the board will just need to talk about that. Um, as it is right now, I think it's envisioned to be there's a couple of touch points throughout the process between now and the end of June when um, the team's work goes out not only to the board but to the community to provide feedback on that so that you're right, by the time we get to the end and we're asking the board to approve it, it isn't something new and it's the first time you're hearing about it. So. Um, right now, those updates would be coming to the board through Committee of the Whole meetings, and if we want to schedule additional meetings for board discussion and updates, we can certainly do that. But otherwise, um, the vision and the process really is guided by CEC as, as the board has selected, and um, the board would have the opportunity to receive those updates and give feedback at Committee of the Whole meeting. But it really is at the board's direction. We can, we can add additional meetings if that is what the board wishes. I think that's what I was trying to speak to in my comments is, I, and I think we'll learn more at this first meeting this week, but I would hope that you all are seeing what's posted here. It's my understanding that the iterations will be there. So some of it is on the member, board members who are not representatives to be following that and then sharing your input because I know I've heard them speak. The ideas that are getting distilled will be shared well prior to us, you know, just having to make a vote. So I will definitely be thinking about how we can share as it's going. I don't know how our board meetings line up with the strategic plan, but I hope that you'll all be seeing what's being posted and uh, sort of proposed in early versions before those meetings or in between. I'm sure we'll figure it out. I just wanted to make sure that it's highlighted that this is an interactive process um, and everybody has to be involved in all directions. Okay, other thoughts on the strategic planning process? All right, thank you very much, Katie, and thanks everyone. The next up is the metrics, I believe, and that's probably Dr. Kramskoli. Yes, I can give a, an update to the group. Uh, the metrics team meets every other week and is scheduled to meet again this Friday. So did not meet last week, but did meet uh, the week prior to that. Um, the dashboard continues to be updated and the full reports uh, still are published each week so that we can continue to follow along there. At the most recent meeting, um, the, the team really spent a lot of time reviewing the experience that has been um, had over the last several weeks um, and really emphasized to the community um, into the administrative team to continue to reiterate the importance of following those healthy habits um, that we know and have been practicing for over a year now. One of the challenges we're identifying is the fact that people are now starting to um, recognize that the community is opening up a little bit more. And so for some, that feels like we can uh, stop some of those mitigation efforts or start to ease off of them, not only in the community but within our schools as well, and, and that simply is not true. Uh, we must continue to really pay close attention to all of those healthy habits, staying home when you're ill or when a household member is ill or being evaluated, 
quarantining as directed is really critically important paying attention to those potential exposure events whether they're through travel through sports through social activities really knowing who you're in close contact with and then acting in response to that potential exposure by isolating or quarantining and really monitoring your symptoms all of those are really really important and remain critical to our ongoing success in in-person learning um, so we have we've taken that advice and continue to emphasize that with our families we'll continue to do that throughout this week I will share my screen here for a second just so we can have a quick look at the um, metrics that are posted right now if I can do this successfully there we go okay um, so as we look here we did we are seeing a little bit of a, an increase there um, not only in those black lines which is the regional positivity rates but um, also in our more localized positivity rates um, because the region is so much larger those trends are a little more consistently seen whereas those red and blue and yellow lines um, tend to peak and valley a little bit more just because the um, N is so much smaller in those uh, catch basins but um, what you see at the tail end there is what appears to be a little more of a plateau possibly a decline and we're really hopeful that that is the case as more and more people have access to the vaccine um, we recognize that as the community started to open up in activities in travel in all sorts of um, opportunities we saw that um, positivity rate start to increase and so now we are very hopeful that we'll see it plateau and begin to decline again um, again as vaccines come into play and as people learn new ways of accessing those opportunities that are available within our community but doing so safely um, those social gatherings those large group events are still risky adventures and so we need to really be aware of what our exposure is in those times and recognize not only our own exposure um, but that of the people we're meeting with if a group of 10 people get together and one in those next couple of days is identified with COVID all 10 are potentially exposed all 10 need to quarantine for that entire time period following that is really what we've learned helps to limit spread and we need to continue to um, carefully adhere to those practices and again the new case rate per 100,000 again we saw that um, uptick here in Wilmette in New Trier Township area and within our staff uh, region so we need to continue to keep a really close eye on that the case identification count um, as well especially post spring break is something noteworthy that we're continuing to monitor many of those cases are connected in one way or another to travel or to some outside exposure uh, known and occasionally unknown um, but more often there is some um, exposure or activity that can be pointed to so again we need to really be cautious as we're um, starting to open up our community and starting to access those opportunities to really continue to be aware of those mitigation efforts and then finally the active cases identified within district 39 um, at this point we do have eight cases identified um, six of those cases have resulted in um, classroom quarantine so I'll talk a little bit about that as we have increased in-person attendance and we have day, five days per week attendance um, when a case is identified if it hasn't previously been isolated that often does result in a classroom quarantine and um, for the 5-8 level because distancing within classrooms has been reduced uh, to less than six feet that is a, a quarantine as directed by the Cook County Department of Public Health for 14 days so that really is impactful um, for those who are placed on quarantine remote instruction fully synchronous is provided during those times when a classroom is on quarantine um, however it still is impactful for those who wish to be in person and, and aren't able to let me see if I can stop sharing my screen here this is always the hardest part of sharing in the first place hmm. we're back here so a couple other things I just want to identify and really highlight for the group in addition to um, continuing to remind everyone of staying home and practicing those mitigation efforts we are really closely examining the experience data from April looking not only at safeguard but also at the other ways in which K 
cases are being identified the testing subcommittee of the metro team will meet this week safeguard collection and processing is occurring again today and then the board will consider and direct the program's extension at the board meeting a week from today whether or not we you as a board want to see that program extended I did talk a little bit about classroom quarantines again those there were six there are six right now that are on classroom quarantine I will share just a little bit about the case identification so that the board is aware I know you receive some information about this but want to make sure that you're up to date on on what has occurred both with safeguard and with other cases identified outside of screening so in summary through April 14th we had six potentially significant findings in the two weeks of sampling that were returning from spring break all of those were confirmed to be a PCR testing on two of those cases were probable cases and concurrently diagnosed the other four were newly identified through screening there was again some travel connected with those many of our families though have done exactly what they should have done for PCR testing upon return from travel but we know this virus is a tricky thing and sometimes the virus doesn't show itself until five or seven days after returning from an exposure event and so again these are really things that we have to pay close attention to the six students that were identified to where at the elementary level for at the five eight level four actually were symptomatic and the other two who were asymptomatic had some known exposure so otherwise knew that they were needing to quarantine or possibly had been exposed and so that's really interesting and noteworthy there were four who reported to us that there was some travel exposure again two of those had some known exposure that occurred during travel and then two who reported some potential outside activities that may have connected them to some exposure again it's really really difficult to point to an exposure events unless you've actually been notified of an individual in your close contact who has COVID-19 but looking back over have you traveled or are you willing to share with us what those experiences have been lead us to better understand what those identifications are John I see you have a hand up do you want me to talk through the non safeguard identified cases? No, I'm curious about so so kids were in school and they knew they'd been exposed and they were symptomatic? No. Okay. No people are doing a really really good job of continuing to follow those yeah what should be the case what happens sometimes is when when a case does get identified you look back and you and parents think about what those symptoms were and so sometimes they're able to say you know he had a stomach ache two days ago but I didn't I didn't connect that yeah with a COVID like symptom and so we just weren't thinking about it in that same way and sometimes it is the same day as safeguard symptoms start to develop and so they're symptomatic but hadn't yet fully developed that and so again we're we only are privy to the information that's provided to us in those instances we're really thankful that people are as honest and forthright with information because it does help us to better understand what those experiences are and helps us to know where we can continue to really emphasize staying home when a family member is is ill or experiencing symptoms is really critically important we knew the travel guidelines we have to follow what the CDC I mean what the Department of Public Health says but even they will acknowledge that they're trying to emphasize testing and in so doing recognize that some exposure would have been missed because if you test before your return that really doesn't give the virus enough time to develop sufficiently to know if you have so there's certainly some some gaps there and again we're so appreciative of families participating in not only this program but accessing testing through PCR or otherwise when they have a symptom when they have any kind of known exposure it's really critical not only quarantine but also test to determine whether or not you are carrying the virus so you're welcome Ellen I see your hand up to do you want me to go through the other cases or you want to ask a question here I wanted to say something I don't know whether you want you to say it now or wait until you go through the cases let me just quick summarize what we found otherwise in that same time period there were cases identified outside of screening there were 13 total cases of COVID-19 that were identified in that same period of time and then the 
period of time, um, one staff member and 11 students. Of those 11 students, there were eight elementary students and four at the 5-8 level. Uh, seven were symptomatic and six were asymptomatic as reported to us. Um, there were some known household diagnoses that occurred there, um, some connected with travel. Uh, so seven of those uh, 11 were connected with travel and then some potential outside activity. And there were four unknown who simply couldn't point to anything that may have increased their exposure. Um, six of those individuals participated in screening when last available at school and there were no findings of potential significance in that. Again, some of those would have occurred right before spring break and these cases were identified right after. Um, two of those individuals participated in screening within one day of that diagnosis, that PCR test, and again, no significant uh, findings there. And then five of those individuals did not participate in safeguard screening. Um, so again, we'll be looking at reviewing not only these data, but those that have been captured since then. We had a few more cases identified at the end of the week. I believe um, today we're processing our safeguard screening, and so we'll see if there are any cases identified through that again, and then we'll proceed from there. Uh, we will also continue to examine options. One of the options that we really carefully considered is a Sunday processing of safeguard screening. Um, I know that that sounds like it would be really valuable and beneficial. Um, there are a couple of challenges we have there. One is that safeguard has indicated that they are not able to process all of our samples on Sunday in time for um, Monday return of results. So we would have to kind of pick and choose who is able to be processed on Sunday. We also recognize that some families continue to participate because we've made it relatively easy for them to do the sample drop off on Monday when they send it just to school with their families. And so we have to kind of weigh the pros and cons there. Obviously staffing on a Sunday would be um, an additional burden to kind of um, navigate. But the other thing that people sometimes forget is a Sunday processing then requires a look back to Friday. So we're always looking back 48 hours from that sample collection. And so it doesn't really free us from all potential exposure because if you're collecting on a Sunday, you have to look back to the Friday for co contact tracing. So if we continue with five days per week of in-person, no matter which day we're sampling on, there's some potential exposure um, that, that needs to be examined there for close contact. So we'll continue to evaluate that. We continue to have discussions as a team about the timing and, and how best to implement the program and strengthen the program. Um, but again, preventing cases really is all of our responsibility. And so emphasizing those healthy habits, staying home when there's potential exposure, when you've been asked to quarantine, really monitoring your symptoms is critically important. I know we're all fatigued with that, but it really, really is important that if you're experiencing one of those symptoms that may be reflective of COVID, stay home, get tested, keep the whole house home until those evaluation results come back. So we'll continue to emphasize that as well. All told though, that is about 4% of our classrooms that um, are on quarantine. And so we recognize that is a really significant impact. The rest of our students are in person daily at this point, if that's the model they've chosen to enroll in. Um, and, and we're having really good success with uh, that model. So. There's, there is kind of a yin and a yang here that we're really navigating. Sorry, Ellen, you had some questions or some feedback? Um, feedback. Um, first of all, I would like to say, number one, I, I love that you emphasize that that's 4% and that um, that leaves 96% of our students that are in school learning, and that's huge. So um, thank you for that. And also, thank you for um, your upbeat way of, of um, giving a message to our families that are doing what they're supposed to be doing the right way um, and reminding families um, that even though we're kind of in the, it's feeling like we're in the home stretch, there's, there's still more to be done. Um, however, um, I'm going to take this moment, not only as a board member, but as a parent, um, to be a little bit harsher, actually, um, in my message, because um, it's come to my personal attention that there are community members that 
um, are not continuing to be vigilant and are not continuing to be responsible. And in that situation, there is no amount of testing or any kind of mitigation or things that we can do as a board, administration, as a school district, or anything to keep COVID out of our schools and our kids in classrooms. And I am on social media and I read the threads and there's a lot of blame and a lot of people um, saying things that are quite nasty and cruel without all the information. Um, and I'm tired of it, actually. And so I wanted to speak up about it um, publicly. And I just wanted to say that missing from those threads is um, are parents who have knowingly ignored school safety protocols, um, parents who have been sending their children to school despite knowing that they allowed their kids to roam maskless, to be in contact with other children, in close contact, um, and exposed to go to events and ride in cars and participate in things um, in a risky manner. Um, and I understand that we're all tired. I'm tired. Um, and I have kids. <laughs> and we all make mistakes. I'm not saying that we don't. So I'm not just blaming. I'm saying I, I get it. Um, but <clears throat> um, the fact of the matter is that, like I said, there's no amount of testing in the world that will keep COVID out of our schools. If people become too self-centered to do the right thing, and um, the reality is, is that people need to be honest with themselves and with their fellow community members. Um, and look past what's most convenient um, and realize that the protocols that are in place are there for a reason. And you might not like them, and you may not think that they're all necessary, but it's the way that we have kept our, we've kept COVID out of our schools this whole year. It's the way that the administration and staff have kept all of the children and families in our district safe all year long. Um, and for that, I'm thankful and appreciative. Um, and so, I know for a fact <clears throat> that there have been families whose kids were exposed in the past two weeks in activities outside of school, and I know there were families that didn't report, and I'm sure there have been all along, and I know there are families that have done rapid tests and thought that that was okay if they did a rapid test and said, and they decided on their own that they were going to send their kids to school on a rapid test. And the reality is that's not good enough. I also know people who have rapid tested and PCR tested and 10 days later have tested positive for COVID. That's the reason that there are 10-day quarantines. That's the reason there are 14-day quarantines now for people that are in contact closer than six feet. And we now have our kids in school because that's what everyone wanted, including me. We want our kids to be in school, but our fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are closer than six feet now. And so we have to be even more careful and more honest and more vigilant and as responsible as ever and make the hard decisions. So when you're 
child is knowingly exposed, you need to call the school and report it and quarantine your child, even if they are asymptomatic and they test twice and they're negative and it's hard and your child complains and they see other kids at school and they don't have any symptoms or whatever, and it sucks. I know it sucks. I've lived through it. I'm living through it right now, I will tell you. But it's the right thing to do because if my child went to school and ended up testing positive after seven or eight days and infected anyone in their class or resulted in having their class quarantined after nine days, I don't know how I could forgive myself. So that's my message to the community is I'm not being judgmental, I'm just telling you, I know it's hard, but please, please, if you want to keep our kids in school, please do the right thing. Please look at yourselves and look at your neighbors and look at your kids and your families and everyone and know that the new strains, the new variants, they are more contagious than ever. It's still, COVID is still here. It hasn't gone away. So, and we've put our children closer now. And there are more of them now in the classroom. And so now is the time to be more vigilant, not less. So that's my message. And I just thank you, Carrie, for everything that you and the administration, the teachers, everything, everything that you have put in place to keep our children safe. And the 96% of our kids that are in school is so heartening. And the people that are doing the right thing, thank you so much. And people that have made decisions that without thinking possibly or have misstepped, please think in the future about making possibly better decisions. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Any other thoughts on this? Okay, I think that's it for strategy then. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it is now time for public comment. Um, public comment will be accepted in person and remotely via Zoom. Are there any, there doesn't look like there's any community members. So, um, Mr. DiMonte, do we have any community members registered that wish to address the board? We have one community member in there, and uh, if they wish to uh, provide a public comment, could you raise your hand in Zoom? And let's just remind people to say their name and community of residence. I'm by board directive. They have three minutes, and we would like you to turn on your camera and leave it on during the duration of your comments. So that person is connected in here twice, which is part of the reason why I need her to raise her hand. Um, but she's in, oh, here we go. All right. Lori, I'll move you over into the meeting. Can you turn your camera on, Lori? Yeah, please? Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Hi. So I just have one question today. Um, I want to know if for District 39, it's a priority to identify asymptomatic COVID cases before they enter the building of any of our schools. So, um, Lori, how we work public comment is that people have three minutes to make their comments. Um, but we don't respond. So it's not like a QA. Um, but you can certainly make a question. We can get back to you after the meeting. Okay. So so my question is just so simple, which is that I want to know if it's a priority for our district to identify asymptomatic cases before they enter the buildings. And the reason I'm asking such a simple and specific question is that I think all of my um, work in this area and advocating has boiled down to this one 
possible difference in opinion that I have from possibly the administration, or maybe we don't, maybe, and that's what I'm trying to get to, which is that there really, in my mind, is only one way that cases are asymptomatically identified at this time, which is through screening. And so I'm just curious if that's a priority for us. And I wanted a, an answer to that question. If it is a priority, then I'm curious if you know of any other way to identify asymptomatic cases before they walk in the door besides one of the screening programs. So that's, that's my question. And it's, it's not, you know, longer than that. It's just that I think that this question has arteries that come off of it, which lead to the potential of more quarantines for in-person learning, um, risks that the people who signed up for hybrid like we did were not willing to take, which is to say that a lot of people are walking in the door without mandatory screening and now possibly no screening at all um, with asymptomatic cases that they're innocently not even aware of. Um, so I understand what Ellen said, and I think that she made a fantastic point, which is our own responsibility to our community, but also what about people who, because of the nature of this virus, simply don't know that they have it and they expose all the other kids in a classroom to this illness or just it, to no in-person school for two solid weeks. I just, I don't understand. And so because of that, I very sadly pivoted my child to remote last week we aren't a family that has underlying illnesses. I'm, I'm sorry, Lori. I'm, can I just end with one sentence to finish one. my thought, which is that I really didn't want to have to do it, but the risk to me seemed like something that we couldn't take on. Um, and I still don't want to be in remote. I just, I, I just want you to consider the question of asymptomatic questions the asymptomatic issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Much. Sorry, I went over. Mr. DeMonte, are there others who wish to speak? There are not. Great. Then we will move on to old business. Do you have anything for equity work on the board? Not at this time. Okay. I, I do have a question. We, we, we had a um, survey that was sent out by Dr. Logan, and so if people saw that or didn't see that, let us know. We should try and re uh, make sure that we get as many of those back as we I can. I will acknowledge it's a, it's a lengthier, it look, it's not a check the box survey uh, in terms of his questions. I think they're qualitative and, and deep and, and really good questions, but it does take a little more than just a two minute sit down. So I know he'd appreciate it if we and I say that I have not completed mine. Just in full disclosure, I think oh, we've I only done remember. one. Yeah. It's because I sort of got stumped. So I think if you can dedicate 10 minutes to really sit down and get a thought, you know, if you appreciate it. Um, Thanks for that reminder. Yeah, yeah. I could use it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Ironically. I will say it brings, it, 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 it makes you do the work, again, in a good, healthy way, I think, to really reflect on what we got out of this. So I think that's good equity work in and of itself, <laughs> in addition to the value it provides Dr. Logan. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Um, so any other old business? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Panzeca for new business. House till 7. Okay. Um, we, uh, we teed it up a little bit at the last meeting, but um, IASB uh, put out a uh, request, a strong request to school boards to weigh in on, um, in particular, um, Illinois House Bill 7. Um, while it was in committee, um, it's now moved out of committee with an eight to nothing vote um, and moved on to the, the general house. Um, IASB is still asking for uh, comments from school boards. Um, in particular, they're strongly advocating um, a negative uh, uh, I don't know, vote, but, but basically to, to, 
to say that this bill should not be turned into a law. Um, so that, that's the position of IASB. Um, I felt it was important that we discuss, um, not necessarily have to reach a resolution today, but that we begin discussion because this is actually a pretty complicated topic. Um, because it fits the, the uh, processes that we've been doing for the last year or two. There have been a number of um, ISB um, and IASB proposals that have come up that as a board we decided that we would discuss even though several of them had absolutely no immediate impact on our school district, but we felt that it was important to have a position. This particular bill could impact our school district. So it's, it's important that we discuss it um, in a timely manner, which I think could be another month or so. So it's not like timely has to be today, but in a timely manner that we get our input one way or the other um, into the appropriate people um, to be consistent with the strategies that we've been using in the past, but also to represent our community. So that, that's kind of the reason why it's on the agenda. Um, some material got sent out um, as feedback for or as initial um, information for this meeting. Um, I don't know how much time people have had in terms of reading it. Um, I can do a two or three sentence summary if, if that would get us onto the same page quickly. Um, so basically what the bill says is um, there's 700 plus um, school districts in Illinois. That's, that's a huge number, you know, like second most in the country. Um, there's inherent waste in it. There are some places that say there's actually some efficiencies and that the net net may not be that much different, but ideally you look at 700 and you say that seems like a large number. Um, so what the bill said was they're going to propose setting up a commission. Um, they've identified basically how it is, but basically it's a state wide commission, so it's not really local representation. The commission will spend up to a year and come back with a mandatory redistricting plan that requires at least 25% of the current districts to be absorbed into other districts. Um, so the, the real plus and minus of it is it's, it's a way of addressing the issue, but it's addressed at the state level and it becomes mandatory. Um, the bill is obviously going to be reviewed. It's 43 pages long. 40 of those pages talk about finances, basically, um, because there's a lot of intricate details. Um, there's the original bill implied things may be combined as units. So a unit district would be a high school and all the feeder districts would be one district, one school board, one administration staff with obviously multiple layers. There's an amendment that said um, it'll only, that was proposing that only elementary schools are combined and only high schools are combined. So there's still a lot of rounding and a lot of detail. But at the next level of detail, and I have some information if we want to get to that next level today, there's a lot of differences. If it ever applied to us, um, the you know reserves, the budgets, the number of students per classroom, um, there's fairly wide discrepancies. I mean, we have 26, 27. Avoca has 14, 15 kids per classroom. Um, teacher salaries are different. Uh, so there's a number of things, and the way the bill is set up, it's one year with this commission that, that basically goes off purposely, independently. They come back with a proposal. The proposal is basically the mandate. Mm -hmm. um, and then, depending on nuances, you know, two to four years to fully implement. 
um, and have everything be um, combined. So, so that, that's the base. Um, Timing-wise, um, probably this late spring would be a vote if there was a vote on it. Some bills get passed out of committee and never get voted on. There was a companion bill in the Senate that didn't get out of committee, but as near as I can tell, that means the House bill, if it passed, would then get moved on to the Senate. So um, that's where it stands time-wise. Like I said, another month or so is still within the range of time to get a position on record. Um, either way, but to get a position on record. And Frank, the position on record would be what? A letter to the General Assembly, a letter to the ISB? Uh, well, what ISB, is the action? ISB had a template. Uh, I guess I didn't send that. I thought I did. But, um, they had a template of like, you know, it's kind of a semi-form letter. You know, we're from the... But did who? Um, Your house members. You yeah. did it. They originally said to the House members, though part of it is also to, uh, oh yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, House members in particular is who they recommended to. Um, they probably want to copy just from the standpoint of then they can, you know, tally their numbers, um, yay or nay, but they can tally their numbers and have an impact that says 98% you know, of the people or whatever had this view. But, but the, the focus is to the House member. Our House member is not on the committee that voted it out, but is on some educational committees. So, um, and obviously wants to represent our community. So whatever we say um, would have some impact, obviously. Thanks for doing all the work, Frank. What do people think? I, uh, I, I read that. I read what you sent. I really appreciate it, Frank, um, sending it. And and I think um, this is one of those things where there could be. I, I mean, love the goal. You know, I'm sorry, flat out adore it. Um, but there will be um, unintended consequences, and, and I think we have a lot to learn, frankly. Um, you know, uh, just as a school board, we. I, I mean, I haven't really thought through what the issues would be of consolidation. You know, I just think, oh, there's savings here, you know, and efficiencies. Um, but there would also be costs. And um, and then the question in my mind would be, well, who would we, um, if it were us, right? Because we're awfully big district. I'm not sure it even makes sense. But what, what would consolidation look like financially? You know, does it make sense? Uh, would any of the neighboring districts be just pushed into our district, the smaller ones? Um, and I guess where I'm going with this is, I, I, if there's gonna be a commission, um, you know that's one thing. Um, but I think the other thing is, you know, what would consolidation look like? What would it, what would our desire be? You know, what if it were a process that we could take control of and hand them? Like, here's the answer. You know, you should you know, whatever, merge us with, who knows. Um, and this is what it would cost, and this is, you know, this, like, I would actually like to understand it more is where I'm going. Pardon the wandering monologue. Others? Yeah. I have a question to your Wilmette already in the top 20% of size of districts. Does that... Out of the 700, yes. So does that mean maybe we would be immune from this? Or no. because of our organization with the theaters and the interior that it's, we're kind of right there? That, that was more of a baseline okay. data point. The, the, one of the things of having a commission at the state with people that are handpicked by representatives, basically, is that it could be anything. Um, I mean, one proposal would be that it's a unit district and Nutria and all the feeder districts become one. There's, like I said, the amendment could be that that doesn't make sense, but for reasons of the commission, who knows, um, and I'll just throw one out, not saying anything that, but it could be our elementary schools are combined with Evanston, or Skokie's elementary school district, and our high school is combined with one of those school districts. 
it doesn't have to be based on any formula the way the bill is set up. The only thing the bill says is 25% of the current districts will be absorbed into other districts. Others? Well, I'll go. I think consolidation is a great idea. I think that we have too many units of local government and that districts that consist of one or two or five schools don't make any sense to me. Um, this is saying, let's have a year-long commission. Let's reduce the number of districts by 25%. I think both of those goals are good. I feel like um, it's exploratory. And so my read of Frank's summary is that first you have the commission, then you have a report, and then it has to get voted on, the recommendations. I'm, I'm reading that it says... The, what, the way I read it and was that the report gets handed to the regional superintendent yeah. who can identify procedural issues with it. There was no... But it can't be law. It, like a, a commission makes a report, not a law. Well, the, the law was that the commission proposes what will happen. Right, but that doesn't mean that's what will happen. They're, they're coming up with recommendations. No commission makes law. Right, but the, the law wasn't to set up a commission. The law was to consolidate. Mm -hmm. And the, com and the commission, commission, says the how. commission identifies how they're going to consolidate. So there is an output, and the output is consolidation. That's part of the law, or would be part of the law if it's bill becomes a law. <laughs> so it, it, it's not, it, the bill isn't set up a commission. The bill is reduce the number of, of districts by 25% and the process of doing that is have a commission identify how that's going to happen. Yep. And so I, I would be in favor of sending a letter in support of the bill and recommending somebody from this board sit on the commission. That's just it's one person's idea. Did you, you had your hand up for a second. Did you well, the, the, what you two are talking about is critical in my mind. What, what, what is the answer to what you're asking? Does the commission, what happens after the commission makes its recommendations? I agree with you, Lisa, in idea. I don't know what happens after they come up with their recommendations. There are obviously lots of steps and things can be amended, whatever, but the way it's set up right now is... So here's the law. It says, on or before May, 20, May 1st, 2022, the commission must vote on its recommended propositions and file a report with the governor and the General Assembly. Right. So that if the commission adopts the report by an affirmative vote of at least 11 members, then the commission's propositions for reorganization of school districts into unit districts shall be filed with the appropriate regional superintendent of schools. That clears it up, Amy. <laughs> 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 Effect is immediately. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, I mean, that's the wording of... Yeah, the, the regional superintendent has weeks I mean, identifies weeks, not months, or uh, to identify any procedural issues, um, and then it becomes a mandate. So I have to admit that that question is less critical to me, as important as I think it is. And the reason is because I'm taking sort of a, a, a Rawlsian veil of ignorance view of the ethics of this, which is that if we say this is an appropriate thing to be done, we think school districts should be consolidated as a general principle, that I'm not sure I feel great about saying, unless it's us. So, you know, what do you, I don't understand. It's, uh, it, it's, if we say, hey, we are in support of consolidating districts, yeah. unless you come and say that we have to consolidate, and then we're not supporting it anymore. That I don't think is an appropriate stance. I don't think anybody's saying that. No, but that is, a, yeah. I, I agree. But then it becomes a question of how the commission works, right? So if we say, yeah, there should be a there should be a way of consolidating districts, and the commission is going to make, you know, there's some commission and it makes a report, 
then I think we're going to have to live with that commission's report, whether or not it then goes back to the legislature and they have to vote on it again, or if it automatically happens as soon as the commission issues the report, or it happens if there are no procedural issues, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the mechanism is it's coming up with, I think that's um, what we have to live with. That said, I agree with you. I'm in support. I, I think we have too many districts. I think... Uh, they should be consolidated, and I'm happy to send a letter in support of doing that. So. Yeah, and then Ellen. You know, I'm simultaneously holding these two ideas, which is I agree with you, but I'm nervous as the sender who has higher class sizes and um, some of those issues, how this would impact us financially. That's a big deal. I mean, how would we, you know, with the pool? Um, would we redistrict? I'm just trying to like. Not, yeah. I know. I don't know. But it, makes, it makes me nervous as a representative of the community when we're on that end of things. How this would impact our taxpayers. Ellen, um, I'm actually I'm in agreement with with you, Lisa and Mark. And, um, I think we there are way too many districts and just too many schools and individuals. Um, and I also though the the key to to this for me is the representation piece of it. And what makes me most nervous is having lived through and been in on kind of a microscopic level um, what happened in CPS when, when Rom took over and decided to consolidate all of the schools in CPS. And just randomly, seemingly randomly, um, Closed schools and combined schools and districts within, you know, Greater Chicago within Chicago, and it was a, in my opinion, having lived through it, it was a disaster. Like it was really rough on a lot of families and a lot of districts. They were busing kids to school districts that like families had no control over, and the and they closed schools and. I mean, so in some situations, it was like backing two dump trucks into each other, and, and it, there was like no rhyme or reason to it, and no one had any say in it, and families had no say in it, and it seemed like districts had no say in it. It was really like the, and maybe it was the way it was handled, um, maybe it was that enough thought didn't go into it. I don't know. It was like it was, but it seems like that was an example of what they're talking about here on a small on a much smaller level because you're talking about the state of Illinois doing this on a grand level but that's that's what makes me nervous about it and so I feel like what was missing there was representation like people had no representation the, the individual you know areas um, within Chicago didn't have a voice so just a couple things on that that's very different than what we're talking about here that was CPS closing schools due to lack of enrollment and poor performance. I, I understand. I know. I know that was. I know that. I know it was different. But I'm saying. I'm saying we're also looking at this as like we're saying okay, there's too many schools, and who decides that? We have not no, too many school districts. That's different than school. Okay, so school district. But who decides which school different district is? less significant than another one, and the families living in, let's say, Kenilworth or whatever, who value the, their intimate district and don't want to be tied into a larger district, you know, they might want that, a voice for their district. So I'm just saying, who is it that gives them a voice, and how do how do they find the representation? So I, I'm agreeing with you in that the only way that I see this working is that there is a, this is that the, 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 the regions really, really have a voice in the decisions that are made. And I do agree that there's too many and, and it's too broken apart, but there has to be representation and voice. Well, I think that those are the two opposing options. Either you handle it locally with representation, which is sort of how things stand, or the proposal here, which is we're going to look at this from a global perspective and figure out how to manage. I, I, I don't think there's a way, I don't think the proposal on the table is to merge the two. I, I mean, yeah. and that's the dilemma. 
that's why this is such a hard, because I think the way it stands now is to handle it the way you're talking about. And that's how we have so many districts. Right. Okay. The, the, the districts will not consolidate, mm -hmm. right, on their own. Nobody wants that individually. So, so, so John, and then I brought this up as a topic I haven't given my personal view yet, but John, did you have anything? Oh, no, I, I did all my early commenting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm torn. Um, it's, I, I think what Lisa threw out as an idea is, is a good one. Um, and, and frankly, it's, it's, not, it's not as if we, we have to do one thing. We could do multiple things. Like we could do our own analysis of what a merger would look like and learn from it. Um, since we have such a brilliant business manager here, even more to do, um, and um, totally not by passing you, Carrie. I would go to you first. Uh, but it, it's not as if you, you you could pick one. Is my point. We could we could go down the road of what Lisa's suggesting and try to understand what the consequences would be. Because it's it, we would be doing a huge disservice, I think, to just our voters by not talking about this all the time, you know, and helping them understand what's going on. You know, ignoring it would be a, a real problem. I guess I do, what, what I was trying to say is I do, I think that in, if we had a representative, if we said, yes, we agree with this, if we have a representative, what I was getting at was, if we have a representative, then I would say it's our responsibility to then be accountable to the other districts around us to listen and to take them into account, like to listen and talk and be open and to take them into account in the decision making process. Like, I guess that was kind of what I was getting at. Does that make sense? Maybe, Mark, you're very good at. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, Frank has a comment. Yeah, so the point of this bill is to take the power away. That That is the point because. When it's said we think it's a, a bad idea to have this many districts, talk about it. We've had slight philosophical discussions with the VOCA, which there's a natural merger, um, and it's been totally rejected by, by them. So the whole point of this is to take control away. It's not, and then we'll have somebody on the board, or when the, the the thing comes out and it's terrible for our, our district that we get to say, never mind. The whole point of this bill is to say, the only way it's going to happen is if you have absolutely no input and when the output comes out, it will be mandated and that's what you have to do. And my concern is, as representatives of our community, if we asked our community, I do not believe our community would say, that they want to give up that power, that our community would want to be forced to merge with any random set of school districts, which is what could happen. Um, so is it important to reduce the number of school districts? Yes. But is it appropriate for our district to give up control to a state commission and then have that mandated on our voters I do not believe our voters would say that, and before we would have that as a position of this board, I think we'd have to have more voter input on that. Because it's way more than just the school people. It, it has implications on tax base. Um, and one of the proposals could easily be that, that even if it's the, the elementary schools as the feeder districts, that Half of Ramona kids end up going to Avoca schools, um, and you know potentially some of our Harper kids end up going to Kenilworth schools. Um, that may or may not be a good idea, but if you try to take our 25 kids and look at the 15 at Avoca per classroom or the 17 at Kenilworth, you would say put some of our kids into those schools, and that's so. I mean, there's all those implications. So philosophically, do we have too many school districts? But when you get to that next level of detail, I don't think 
we'd be representing our constituents by saying we give up any ability to decide how this is going to be done. No, I think, Frank, that who our constituents are is the taxpayers as well. And this is, the issue is, right, that we are collectively bearing the burden of too much overhead as a result of too many local government entities. And so a couple other things. First is, whatever they're due, they're going to have public hearings, right? It's a year-long commission, and there is no such thing as coming up with a consolidation plan with no input. Um, the second piece is that, um, Ellen, to your point, we can suggest that we are willing to serve, but we can't say we're only going to approve this if we get a seat at the table. I don't, I, I don't know that that would uh, work. Um, and the next piece is sometimes you have to make change for the common good. Our state is broke. Our educational system is broke. And sometimes we all have to take risks for the betterment the common good betterment. And I hear your point, Frank. And the truth is we don't know what would come out of this commission. And maybe it'll be good and maybe there'll be some pain. But, you know, for me personally, our state's broke and we need to do something different. So our, our taxpayers in District 39, we already have an efficient district. We already have one of the larger districts. We already have, you know, less cost per pupil than, than most of the other districts in, um, in Trier. If we get blended in with Evanston, I have absolutely no idea what that would mean. But for our, for our taxpayers, this is not a plus. It's good for Illinois, maybe, and probably, though ISBE actually did their own analysis for whatever input they had and said that this kind of consolidation actually net net not being cost effective. Um, I don't know if I agree or disagree with that, but, but that's a data point. But for our taxpayers, we're an efficient school district. We have a reasonable size to be efficient. And any differences from that will probably impact the amount of money that our taxpayers um, will, will pay. So as an Illinois scheme, um, this probably is the only way this is going to happen, but for our taxpayers, um, I would think that this is a negative and I think we'd have to have really strong community input before we go on record. If we go on record saying this is a cool idea and a commission gets set up, this will be one of the first districts that the commission says, cool, they think it's a good idea, let's do it there. So it's not a non-event if we say this. It will increase the probability that our district is one of the districts that gets merged. Um, so we, we, it's not like a, you know, it, it, it's not an event that says that if we make that decision that it has no ramifications on our taxpayers. Okay, but Frank, I just want to say there's going to be a formula. It's not going to be like all those who wrote a letter in favor get hit first. Right? It will be there will be strict criteria. I just want to put. Yeah. I have a process question. Yes, I'm I was going to go there. Nope, no, no, that I needed to go there. So go <laughs> ahead. Well, you, you can go nope. ahead with the process if no, you want. No, no, you can take a turn at it. Let's see I, what you come up with. I think there are three options. We can send a letter in support. We can send a letter opposing, and we can not send a letter. And my process question is, today at this meeting right now, are we trying to get to one of those three, or are we going? To, or are we trying to just have a discussion and we will determine which of those three we're going with later? My, my, my concept that this is a complicated enough issue that it needs to be teed up. Um, I think that the timing says that we don't have to make a decision today, and I don't think we have enough thought into this yet to make a decision today. And on top of that, we do have a new board um, yep. in weeks. And for something this significant, I think it really should be done by the new board. Um, so my thought for today was to tee it up with some facts, the beginning discussion. There's obviously lots of pros and cons. Um, and then to discuss it again, probably at the next committee as a whole. So let me, I, I'll just 
look around and I see some nodding of heads. So we're not trying to get to a decision today, it sounds like. When is the letter due from? The, the first window was before it got out of committee because that's the most leverage and that window's passed. The next is when bills become laws, which would be June or sometime after that, if it ever really got voted on. But the next window is before June. Really what it so I, I just want to understand. So you're no, saying, when is this going to vote? Go ahead, Amy. It says, um, will be taken up on the House floor for a vote. The bill must be defeated prior to the House third reading deadline, April 23rd. So this sounds like it's timely. Yeah. Like, I don't know. This is IASB who's wanting us to act, so it could be their own. Yeah. So I just want to say, we haven't heard from Dr. Kromoskoli on uh, her thoughts. <laughs> I have uh, been around the school consolidation discussion for many, many years, and I think that the points that you all raised are, are the points that will continue to be raised. It's either a local decision, in which case it's a really hard decision for communities to make because there are so many offsets for the benefits that potentially could be realized. There are also really significant detriments, and so if it's a localized decision it's a really difficult decision to be made. It is not never made, though. It just is more difficult to be made. I come from two districts, both of which, both of which have uh, consolidated with neighboring districts um, for a, a myriad reasons. Uh, but they found it to be beneficial, and they pursued that, and, and they did, in fact, consolidate with, uh, I was in the larger district, they consolidated with the smaller district. Um, it is not an easy decision to make, and it does, apart communities in the process, not, not never to be rebuilt again, but there's some impact of that. If instead we're going to take a state commission and they're going to direct it, if you want my honest opinion, I think politically um, that would be really difficult to actually come to fruition because there are so, there's so much local control over school districts in Illinois and um, that's afforded to us in many different ways. And so. Um, so I don't have a stance on, on the benefits and drawbacks. I know that the only way to make it work well is if the community is behind the idea to have it forced upon a school district. Um, something more detriment than benefit. Yeah. In, in my humble opinion, having um, experienced it just a little bit, um, but not having researched it nearly as much as I'm sure the experts who sit on a commission to really tackle this would be able to research it. So definitely benefits and drawbacks, and I don't think there's an easy answer here, so. And so it sounds imminent, though, is what I'm hearing. Like, well, I don't know, that's IASD who wants us to advocate. So I don't know if that April 23rd date is accurate or essential. I don't feel ready personally to make a decision today on how we intervene, but that's what they say. Yeah, the, There's the some April, April 23rd I, deadline. Every step becomes harder to influence. You know, getting it out of committee was the most leverage. They made a big deal about that. The third reading makes it a, a official thing that gets discussed. They're making a big deal about that, but things like this don't get voted on until June. So, you know, it's a, your leverage changes a little bit, but it's not the, the last window. Well, I, I don't hear any readiness on the board today to come to a decision. And so my suggestion would be that, look, if, if it's an April 23rd deadline, we're not going to make that mm -hmm. anyway. So we kind of can say, well, we missed our chance. Um, but I would suggest then that we maybe take a couple more minutes to discuss where we want to get to and then uh, maybe we set up somebody to say okay let's let's make sure that we know what the timeline is and then make a timely decision assuming that we we still can um, and discuss that at future board meetings Does that so Mark, thanks for the process yeah. I, I think that's right but I do want to say in the couple minutes that remain we actually do it on process instead of the subject because I would want to know, in addition to the time, like when do we need to weigh in, what information would you all want that would make you feel like you were informed to put a stake in the ground or not? 
And then, Frank, would you be willing to get that information? Yes. Right, what questions do you want Frank to look into to, to well, help? Maybe exam states that do this well and or have had success or, you know, if, if we're so low in terms of the high number of districts that we have, where are states that manage their districts differently and well? I, I can look up. That's something I'm curious about. Um, I was just going to add on to that, that the, the other critical part of that question is, do they do it well because the state education system was created that way from the first place, yeah. or, do they, or do they actually pursue consolidation right. of smaller districts into yeah. what now are effective and efficient larger districts, which um, right. there are states that just started with larger districts from the get, yeah. so it's a different different Absolutely. model. John. I'm interested in the politics and who supports the bill and, and where this is going. That's, that's what I'd want to know. I'm, just, I'm typing up the questions and I'll send it to you, Frank. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. I heard a clear question around what the process would be for determining the districts, whether the commission does it automatically or whether there's input. I, no, I don't know if that will be a land them on, but we'll see. Uh, I personally would be very interested to know if anybody's done work on what the optimal size for a district mm -hmm. is. I suspect it's larger than Sunset Ridge and smaller than Chicago. <laughs> I guess my, my question is who's going to, you know, are there going to be resources to support the commission? Because I wouldn't feel good unless there was a big analyst or consulting firm um, doing the analysis, right? So it would be yeah. commission plus resources. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I, I think if we're, we have to get some kind of sense of the, of the community. Um, I mean, it's an awkward thing to necessarily survey, so I, so I don't know how to do that, but um, this is one of the more impactful things that, a, well, if, if our input has any value at all, you know, you can always argue, you know, we're one of 700, <laughs> um, and whatever they decide to do isn't going to be based on whether we say yay or nay, but assuming that we always take the position that what we say is important and people listen to us, um, then we should make sure on a topic that impacts our community. I mean, some of these other topics we've, we've had, you know, don't allow guns in our school, we wanted to take as a board a position, but, but frankly nobody in our, in our school district was going to say that's a bad idea. Um, or very few, and it didn't actually change anything in our community anyway because we were never going to have guns in our school. This could dramatically impact people in our school district, and I think we need to have some, if we decide to go forward with it, we need to have some feel for how the community feels. And I don't know how to do that because it's a really awkward question, but um, I, I don't feel comfortable as a board saying that we know what the community would say on something that, that literally could impact house prices, um, you know, what schools your kids go to versus your you know, kids of different ages or you moved into, like I said, Ramona district and you end up in a Boca district. I, I mean, it could be, it literally could be anything. Okay, any other questions? And then we'll close this discussion and move on. Thank you everyone for a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Frank, for all your legwork. Thank you, Frank. Um, is there any other new business? Okay, great. So now I, we are going to adjourn to executive dis, uh, Executive session to discuss negotiations and specific personnel. May I have a motion to adjourn to executive session? I move to adjourn to executive session to discuss negotiations and specific personnel. May I have a second? Second. May I, uh, motion having been made and seconded, will the clerk please call the roll? Second. 